Oh my gosh, it is so great to be in New York and to be up here in the Capital Region. I am so proud to be standing on this stage with two friends and former colleagues. I'm grateful for their service, their leadership, and their support. I was listening to Paul as he was talking about the work we did together, and it's absolutely the case that he has tackled some of the most difficult challenges facing our state and our country, and now he is taking on another difficult challenge. He is focused on fixing the infrastructure of our water systems here in New York and across America, and he's trying to get support from the Congress, and I will do everything I can if I'm fortunate enough to be your president to make sure you do, Paul. You know, when you think about all of the challenges we face here in America and around the world, although it may not be in the headlines, water is one of them. That's why we've got to protect our water resources. I was proud to work with so many to clean up the Hudson. We also have to make sure that water systems across this state, like Hoosick Falls and others, are clean and pure so that we can take absolute confidence in the water we drink and use. And New York is in such a critical position because so much of the rest of the country doesn't have enough water. We have to be good stewards of our water. And so, Paul, I look forward to working with you. And I have to tell you, it was a really hard decision for me to leave the Senate. I adored being your senator. I loved representing New York. It was the greatest honor imaginable that the people of New York took a chance on me in the 2000 election and let me serve you and then reelected me in 2006. And when President-elect Obama asked me to be Secretary of State, I said, I'm so honored, I'm so flattered, Mr. President-elect, but I love representing New York in the Senate. And he said, well, with all the problems we're inheriting from the Bush administration, he said, I trust you to be my Secretary of State. And I, I told him not once but twice that although I understood the importance of the job, I wanted to represent all of you in the Senate. So he said to me, I don't want to talk to you again until you say yes. <laughs> so I, I said to my husband, I said, you know, I'm so flattered. The president-elect has asked me and I've told him no twice and he keeps telling me that he doesn't want to talk to me until I say yes. And Bill looked at me and he goes, well, I asked you to marry me twice. You said no. And I said, let me know when you're ready. And he said, so maybe there's a pattern here. <laughs> and eventually, of course, I did say yes. And it was such an incredible experience working so closely with the president to frankly try to undo a lot of the damage that had been done the prior eight years. But I have to tell you, I felt so much better about making this decision when Kirsten was asked to succeed me and to fill that Senate seat because, as she said, I had known her since 2000, this bright young lawyer from Albany, and I saw her in action. She supported me, she raised money, she made speeches, she made phone calls, she just did everything she could to get me elected to the Senate. And so when she decided to run for the House some years later, I was all in.
So I was helping her, speaking for her, because I knew what a great representative she would be. And then, of course, she has been a superb senator, along with Chuck Schumer for New York. So I know what good hands New York is in. I want to just take a few minutes to tell you what you probably already are thinking. This election is one of the most serious, consequential elections we've had in a long time. It is for a number of reasons. The differences between the two parties are stark. Now, I believe the facts prove that our economy does better when we have a Democrat in the White House. <clears throat> and we saw that in the 1990s when my husband was president and 23 million new jobs and incomes went up for everybody. And then what happened? We reversed course. The Republicans came back with their failed economic policy of trickle-down economics. Ah, it deserves a lot of booze. When I was in the Senate, I was arguing and voting against these policies because I believed then it would reverse the economic progress we were making. We had a lot of work still to do here in upstate and other places, but they got their way. Slash taxes on the wealthy, take their eyes off of the financial markets and the mortgage markets, and we know what happened. When President-elect Obama called to ask me to come to Chicago to talk about becoming Secretary of State, before we talked about the world and our challenges, he just looked at me and he said, it is so much worse than they told us. We were losing 800,000 jobs a month. Nine million Americans lost their jobs. Five million homes were lost. And $13 trillion in family wealth was wiped out. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I want you to remember it. I want you to know what the real different choices are. We have people running for president on the Republican side, led by Donald Trump, who are... He's not the only one. He may be the most flamboyant, but they all want to take us back to trickle-down economics. And we cannot allow that to happen. We cannot. The most important economic issue in this campaign will be ensuring that we have a Democrat in the White House come next January. So here is what I have been advocating, because it's not just enough to keep going along and making progress. I want us to really have broad-based inclusive prosperity again more good jobs, rising incomes. That's why I've laid out plans for how we get more infrastructure jobs, including the creation of a national infrastructure bank to fund what we need to do with our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our ports, our airports. And it's not just what we see, we also have to fix our water systems, our sewer systems, leaking pipelines under the ground. We have work to do, and these are good jobs. These are mostly union jobs where people can make a good living. And then I was in Syracuse a few days ago announcing my manufacturing agenda because I want us to make it in America. And I, I know we can do that. We see what's happening right here in the capital region with nanotechnology and biotechnology and chips and other things that are being made in America right here in New York. I remember when I first worked on nanotechnology and I was telling people in the Senate, I wanted to get some funds to really begin to invest in nanotechnology right here in the capital region. 
It seemed like a long time ago. But look at the progress we've made. That's what we need to do across upstate, indeed across America. But the reason I emphasize upstate is because we have the skills, we have the hardworking people, we have the infrastructure. I will be the president who brings manufacturing back to upstate New York and America. And another way we're going to create a lot of new jobs is by combating climate change. And <clears throat> I care deeply about this issue. I worked on it. I thought we were making progress when I was in the Senate. There were Republicans who would actually make a speech about it, take a trip. I took trips with people like John McCain. We went to some of the northernmost places in America and in the world to look at what was happening up in Alaska, over at Svalbard, the northernmost uh, inhabited island in a, the world. I thought we were making progress. And then all of a sudden, between extreme partisans and the Koch brothers, you can't get a Republican anymore to even say the words climate change. You know, when they're asked, those running for president, they all say the same thing. Well, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. And I keep saying, well, go talk to a scientist and listen to a scientist. You know, there, I, I bet you could talk to a teacher right here at the high school and get a good lesson about climate change. <laughs> but you know, they're afraid to even face this. So back in 2009, when I became Secretary of State, I immediately began working with the President to try to lay the groundwork because we had to get fast-growing countries like China and India and others to sign on to cutting their emissions. And it took years, but we finally got it done. I was really proud that thanks to American leadership, we got that agreement signed in Paris that commits the rest of the world to taking steps to deal with climate change now we have to figure out not only how we continue to lead, but how we can be the leader because some nation is going to be the 21st century clean energy superpower. Right now, if I were guessing, I'd say it would be either Germany, China, or us. I want it to be us, and I intend for it to be. Because it's not only the right thing to do to protect our environment, to protect our people's health, to protect our planet, but it's also smart. There will be millions of new jobs and businesses coming out of the efforts to combat climate change. I've set two big goals. I want us to deploy a half a billion more solar panels by the end of my first term, and Enough clean energy to power every home in America by the end of my second term. You know, my friends, it is easy to tell somebody what you're against. I want you to know what I'm for. I want you to know what my plans are, why I think we can do this together. Because it is also important we do more for small business. Small business will create about 75% of the new jobs, and I want to have a much more supportive environment for that. And I especially want to focus on young people who want to start job, uh, new businesses and job creation and entrepreneurialism. And I have to say, I was very proud to stand with Governor Cuomo today in New York City as he signed the increase in the minimum wage, which I think which I think is important, first and foremost, to lift people who work full-time out of poverty. But here's what I want you to understand. We are a 70% consumption economy. You know what that means? If people don't have money in their pockets to spend, we don't grow. So the more money we get back into the most pockets, instead of the most money going to the fewest pockets of people at the top, the faster our economy will grow and more jobs with rising incomes will be good for everybody.
And you know, one of the best ways to quickly raise incomes is to finally guarantee equal pay for women's work. <laughs> Again, to me, this is about growth and fairness. Is it a woman's issue? Of course it is. But it's also a family issue. It's also an economic issue. Any family who has a woman working who's not being paid fairly is penalized. You know, when you go to the store and you check out with what you're buying, they don't say, okay, you only make 78 cents on the dollar, so we're only gonna charge you 78 cents on the dollar. That's not the way it works. So we've got to think. We need to grow the economy, and we need to be sure the economy is fair. And one of the ways we have to do that, too, is to penalize those companies that want to ship jobs overseas because there is less and less reason for them to do that. So here's what I'm proposing. If any company ever got one penny of taxpayer help from a local, county, state, or federal government, then they have to pay it all back because they got that help to keep jobs right here in New York and America. And if any company wants to move abroad, and some of them do what's called an inversion, which I call a perversion, they move their headquarters, they pretend to move so they can avoid paying taxes. Anybody who does that, we're gonna slap the biggest exit tax on them to make them think twice about leaving our country. And we're going to enforce trade agreements like I did when I was in the Senate. I pushed hard to enforce trade agreements. I voted against the only multinational one that came before us, and I said I'm against the Trans-Pacific Partnership because I don't think it will raise incomes and produce jobs for New Yorkers and Americans. Now, everything just about I've said the Republicans disagree with. That's going to be a real choice because we can go back to the old ways, the old snake oil, or we can do what works. And I think we've got a pretty good idea of what that is. It's also true for education. We need to start with early childhood education, universal pre-kindergarten. And then in elementary and secondary school, I wanna be a good partner to our teachers. I want to support our teachers. I am tired of all the scapegoating of our educators. What we need to be doing is helping to support our teachers and our educators to get the resources they need to do the job we ask them to do. And I also have a plan to make college affordable again. Now, I share that goal with Senator Sanders. We have a different way of doing it, and I want you to understand the difference because I think it is important. I've said, look, we need to have debt-free tuition. You don't have to borrow a penny to go to college. Now, if you're wealthy, you have to pay. I believe that is a fairer and more affordable way to get to affordable college. And so what I have said is, I'm gonna work to make sure everybody who needs it gets to go to a public college or university without borrowing a penny and I want to work, I want to work to get the cost down. So I am asking students to work 10 hours a week because if they do work at the college or university, that will help lower the cost. And then we can actually get the cost down for more people and that will help us send more 
to college. And I will pay for it by taxing the wealthy. And I can afford to do that the way I've got it set up. Now, Senator Sanders, as I said, has the same goal. He advocates for free college. Now, that means free for everybody, including Donald Trump's kids. I don't think we need to do that. I think we need to focus on where the problem is. Middle class families, working families, poor families. And Senator Sanders' plan depends upon governors chipping in about a quarter of the cost. Think about that. About 30 of our governors are Republicans. They are working as hard as they can to take money away from higher education. You know, I spent time this last week in Wisconsin where their governor, Scott Walker, has cut $250 million from higher education. So under Senator Sanders' plan, he would be expected to contribute $300 million. Now, I do believe in deathbed conversions, but I am not at all counting on Scott Walker having a change of heart. So I don't want to make a promise I can't keep. I can make and keep the promise of debt-free tuition so that more of our young people can get to college. And then we are going to make it easier for you to pay down and end your student debt. How many people here currently have student debt? Oh, yes, lots of hands. Does anybody here know if you have an interest rate higher than 8%? Anybody? Okay. Anybody higher than 10%? I feel like I'm in an auction. <laughs> I want everybody in the audience to hear this. We have young people who are paying 6, 8, 10, 12, even 14% interest. Nothing has that kind of interest except credit card debt if you don't pay it back, right? But you can finance your, refinance your mortgage, you can refinance your car. We are going to make it absolutely clear. You can refinance that student debt. Get down and out from under those high interest rates. We will save millions of people thousands of dollars. And then we're going to move people into programs like I had. When I got out of law school, I did go to work for the Children's Defense Fund. I think I was paid about $14,000 a year. So I could not have afforded a big interest rate. I paid my loan back based on a percentage of my income. And it still took me about 15 years, but I got it paid off. So we're going to have people pay back as a percentage of their income, and then we're going to end, we're going to end your obligation after 20 years, you're done. I'm not going to keep this going. And we are going to stop our government from making a profit on lending money to young people to get an education. And the other part of whether or not you can produce results for people is whether we get everybody access to quality, affordable health care, something I care deeply about. You know, before there was something called Obamacare, there was something called Hillary Care. Some of you can remember we had quite the battle with the drug companies and the insurance companies, and they won that time. They really knocked us down. But then I got back up and I said, okay, what can I get done? And that's when I helped to create the Children's Health Insurance Program, which provides health insurance to eight million kids. And that's why I was so thrilled when President Obama passed and signed the Affordable Care Act. We've been trying to do this since Harry Truman. And now we've got it done, and 90% of Americans are covered. Here's what I want to do. I want to get the costs down. I want to get the choices up. I want to go right after the drug companies to rein in prescription drug costs. 
and we're going to start by requiring them to negotiate for lower prices with Medicare. Because that will ripple through the entire health care system. So these are some of the issues that I've been talking about and setting forth ideas and plans about how to address, because I think the first test that you should hold anybody running for president to see whether or not they meet is can they actually make your life better? Can they make a positive difference in improving the lives of Americans? I want to tell you what I want to do because I want you to hold me accountable for doing it. And I also want you to know where I stand on rights because the Republicans want to strip away, undermine, erode every single one of our rights. Our civil rights, our women's rights, gay rights, voter rights, worker rights, rights for people with disabilities. So here's where I stand. I will defend a woman's right to make her own health care decisions. <clears throat> I will defend Planned Parenthood from these partisan political attacks. I will defend marriage equality and work to end discrimination against the LGBT community. I will defend voting rights and work to end Citizens United and its corruption of our political system. I will defend Social Security from the Republicans' efforts to privatize it. I will defend the Veterans Administration, make it better, but prevent the Republicans from tearing it apart. I will keep working for comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship. I will work to give more opportunities to people with disabilities when it comes to education and training and housing. And I will continue to fight for common sense gun safety reforms that will save lives in our country. So we have a big agenda here at home, but the second test you should hold any candidate to is can this person keep us safe? Can this person lead us with strength and values in the world? And I'm going to do my best to make sure that all the experience that I've had starting as your senator after 9-11 and going all the way through my Secretary of State years is put to good use to keep our country safe and to make sure we work with our friends and our allies. You know, as some of you remember, after 9-11, we were not sure what was going to happen next. And we knew we had to be prepared. And I give great credit to the NYPD to the FDNY, to everybody working to keep us safe. And we learned a lot of lessons. We learned, for example, that everybody had to be part of our defense. We had to reach out and make everybody understand that if they saw something suspicious or heard something suspicious, they should report it. And thousands of people did. And it proved to be a really smart strategy. So when I hear Donald Trump or Ted Cruz with those offensive comments they make about Muslims, it's not only wrong, it's dangerous. Because what we've got to do, <laughs> is make sure everybody feels comfortable and welcome to pick up that phone or to go on to their computer to report something. And the people on the front lines who are going to hear more and see more are very often in our American Muslim communities. And we also have to have coalitions with many nations in order to defeat ISIS, something that I have some experience in doing because I put together the coalition that brought Iran to the negotiating table by imposing crippling sanctions.
So when Donald Trump talks about pulling out of NATO or keeping Muslims out of the United States or even abandoning our allies in the Pacific, that does not make him sound strong. It makes him sound like he's in over his head. <laughs> Finally, the third test. Can you unify our country? Because we have too much divisiveness. You know, there are so many people who are worried, even fearful, and sometimes angry about what's happening in our country. I understand that, especially when you think about what I told you concerning the Great Recession. A lot of people were just knocked flat, and some of them haven't fully recovered yet at all. So I know that there's a lot of concern, but to play to that in a way that brings out anger and prejudice and paranoia doesn't help us solve our problems. It's okay to get angry, and then once we get angry, we gotta figure out what we're gonna do about it. What's our plan? What's our strategy? We are at our best. You know, so much of American history came out of New York. We are at our best. And remember what our great former governor and president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said, all we have to fear is fear itself. So I will go anywhere, anytime, to meet with anyone to find common ground. And I will also stand my ground, but I know how important it is to keep trying to solve problems together. A lot of the work that Paul has done in the House, and I know particularly that Kirsten has done in the Senate, you work with a lot of people that you don't agree with on maybe 90% of the issues, but you try to find that 10% and figure out what you can do to make a difference. That's what I wanna do as your president. I will get up every single day and work for the results that will make a difference in your lives to keep us safe and to unify our country. And I wanna end on what Kirsten said about people who inspired her and mentored her, and I'm honored to be listed with her grandmother and mother, and she mentioned my mother. You know, I often wonder at how my mother came out of what was a very neglectful and terrible childhood, literally being sent away, not wanted by her parents, to grandparents who didn't want her either, and then ending up working as a housemaid at the age of 14, and looking for something that would be meaningful to her. And she was fortunate because the woman in whose home she worked in realized my mother wanted to go to high school. And so they worked it out. She would get up really early in the morning and do the chores she had to do, and then literally run to high school, go to high school, and then run back and finish the chores. She did that for four years. I asked her one time, when I was old enough to understand what she'd gone through, how did you survive this? And she said, you know, at critical moments in my life, somebody showed me kindness. A kind word, a kind gesture. It made all the difference to her. So in this campaign, I've been talking about how we need more love and kindness toward each other in our country. <laughs> how we have to try again to see the world through others' eyes and then figure out what we can do to make it better. And then finally, I'm inspired every day by my granddaughter. You know, having an 18-month-old granddaughter with another on the way this summer is just... <clears throat> it's personally the most wonderful thing that has ever happened. It is like falling in love all over again. But here's what I want you to know. 
Of course, Bill and I are going to ensure that our granddaughter has every opportunity in life. But that is not enough. It really matters what kind of country she and all of our other kids will become adults in. Is it a country that is still believing in and realizing the promise of America for everyone or just for a few? And it really matters what kind of world is out there waiting for her and every other child in our country. Is it a safe world? Is it a prosperous and peaceful world? Is it a world where we're able to deal with climate change and all the other challenges we face? So here's what I want you to know. I don't think it's enough that my granddaughter has opportunities in life. I want your children and grandchildren to have exactly the same opportunities to live up to their dreams, to fulfill their own potential. That will be the mission of my presidency. I need your help on April 19th. Please come out and let's vote for a future that we will make together. Thank you all so much.